So this morning I wanted to look with you at the very heart of our salvation in Christ. Um, what makes Jesus our Savior? Um, how did He save us? At the core, what is our salvation in Christ? What did God really do in the Gospel? What is the very heart of our salvation? And the, the answer is our union with Christ, the doctrine of our union with Christ. Underneath all of what God has done for us and the revelation of the Gospel, it is this, God and all of who He is has united Himself to us in Christ. And our salvation is sharing in the life of His Son, Jesus Christ. And there is a lot of different ways and angles in which the scriptures reveal to us. God reveals to us uh, our union with Christ. Um, but the predominant phrase that you constantly hear is, You who are in Christ. And notice what type of union in Christ signifies. In Christ is not a joining side by side. But in Christ, the union that the, that the believer shares with Christ is the strongest that it could be. When you are in something, in this sense, you can't go any further to be joined to it. It is stronger than touching. It is becoming one to the point where all that he does, I do. All that I do, he does. You share everything. He is mine and I am His. In justification, that is what's declared to us. All that, it, all that He is and all that He has is declared unto us. And all that we have, all that who we are, is in Him. And this, Paul, this is Paul's favorite phrase, in Christ Jesus, in the Beloved, in the Lord. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. It's repeated over and over and over again. Um, and this was not just some rhetoric that Paul used, some religious rhetoric, so that we can use as kind of like a chant to sound more Christian. He, he meant something by it. This phrase, this phrase actually transforms lives. It causes true reformation. He saw the whole Christian life as one being in Christ. The truth is that this phrase and its significance is the very bottom, or it's like the deep hum of all that God has revealed to us. It is like the life by which all other doctrines of the faith come alive. And without this, without union with Christ, everything lies dead. In John 15, we see Jesus Christ referring to Himself as the true vine, and we the, branch, we the branches abiding in Him. This is an illustration of our union with Christ. And this illustration, He is teaching us about how fruit flows out into our lives by that union. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. Later on in verse 11, you read this, These things I have spoken to you. Just talking about that illustration about our union with Christ. These things I have spoken to you in order that my joy may remain in you, be in you and that your joy may be full. So Christ speaks words to me, and those words produce joy in me. And He says that that joy that I'm experiencing is actually His joy. If it is His joy in me that I'm experiencing, why does He say that your joy may be full? Is it His joy or is it my joy? He says that your joy may be full. And the point is this, 
that as I'm united to Him and abiding in Him, His joy becomes my joy. My joy is His joy. It is one joy. It's union. The same thing could be said about all the other fruits of the Spirit. Even our practical righteousness my practical righteousness is my sharing in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I should never look at my practical righteousness apart from abiding in Christ. It's by abiding in Christ that we bear fruit. Paul uses similar phrases in Philippians 1. He says this, For God is my witness... He says, for God is my witness. Now, everything that after that phrase, for God is my witness, it better be true. He says, how I yearn for you with the affections of Christ. The affections of Christ Jesus, Paul is yearning. Paul is expressing how he is sharing in Christ's affections. So, are they Christ's affections or are they Paul's affections? They are by the Spirit one source of affections and Paul is sharing in the affections of Christ in that same chapter chapter 1 of uh, Philippians and verse 21 he says this for for to me to live is Christ all of his life is one of sharing in Christ we're talking about union with Christ in other places of his writings, he speaks about his suffering as a participation in the sufferings of Christ. And he goes even so far as to say that he is filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the church. Now, and by no means is Paul saying that in some way Christ is insufficient in his sufferings. But what Paul is realizing, he's seeing, it's not as if he's stepping in the gap. He needs to fill the gap that Christ didn't fill. That's not what he's saying. He's saying here that he is realizing his participation in what Christ is presently doing in the church, so much so that Christ is still being afflicted in Paul's body. We're talking about union with Christ. How united are we really to Christ? On the Damascus Road, Paul, on his way to pers persecute Christians, he experiences the revelation of Jesus Christ and a light shone around him and Christ, the resurrected Christ appears to him. And he says, Paul, 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 why are you persecuting my church? Is that what he says? No. no, he says, why are you persecuting me? In Matthew 25, Jesus Christ teaches that as you did it unto them, the least of my disciples, as you did it or did it not to them, my disciples, you did it also to me. So why does he say me in these verses? The reason is because how united the church is to Christ. He is the head, we are the body. We are the bride, He is the bridegroom. When one member of Christ's body is being afflicted, He is afflicted. The reason is because He has fully united Himself to us. There is no separation. We are in Him. And this is good news. Union with Christ means sharing in the life of the Son with the Father by the Spirit. If you will, go to 1 John 5, verse 9. So in 1 John 5, verse 9, we start to read, If we receive the witness of men, 
The witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe, God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. So we're to see eternal life, our salvation in Christ, as all of one as being, this life is in His Son. Verse 12, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life, these things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Union with Christ is the sum of our whole salvation. Every part of, of our salvation revealed to us in the Scriptures comes from, is sustained by, and flows toward union with Christ. To be in Christ and to be with Christ is the end of our whole salvation. It's the end of God's love toward us and the gospel. A preacher named Albert Martin once said that union with Christ, unlike any other gift, has its roots in eternity past and its fruits in eternity future. Because we were predestined in Christ. We will be glorified in Christ. Every part of our salvation, from our predestination, our calling, our justification, adoption, regeneration, sanctification, glorification, all of His promises, all of His warnings, His commands, and all of the active providences of God in our life, every spiritual blessing that has been given to us has been given to us and is revealed to us in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. When it says every spiritual blessing, it means every spiritual blessing. And the only way they come to us is in Christ. And not only that, every spiritual blessing not only is given to us in Christ by God, but they have our being in Christ as their end. And this really starts to define for us all the doctrines of our salvation. When we think about predestination, justification, adoption, sanctification, glorification, these are not the final gifts. They're not the final gifts. They're not given to us as gifts as ends and of themselves. Heaven is not the final gift. Forgiveness of sins is not the final gift. Being, being spared from the wrath of God is not the final gift. All of these that I'm mentioning are in no doubt gifts that should be received by faith, but only so far as they are means by which we are united to Christ and all of who God is in Christ. Union with Jesus is the end to which all other gifts flow. Think about each one. In God's salvation, each one of these gifts, like justification, regeneration, sanctification, glorification, it's like God is overcoming obstacles of our be being united to Him. We have obstacles like our sin nature. We need regeneration. Uh, remaining sin. We need sanctification. Death. Condemnation. These gifts of, and these gifts of salvation come to us in a particular order. It is like each one overcomes a different obstacle until we are finally, finally and fully united to Jesus Christ. 
And that's the end of everything in Revelation. Revelation 21, and then the end of 22. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, being united to Him, finally and fully. We also see how in our union with Him, we are so united with Him that the Scripture says that as He died on the cross, we died on the cross. When He was buried, we were buried. When He rose from the dead, we rose from the dead. As He sits in the heavenly places, right now we are seated with Him in the heavenly places. Why is Paul saying that? Like, I'm here right now. No, I'm seated with Him in the heavenly places because I'm in Christ. This is why we can wholeheartedly say, Jesus Christ is our salvation. The Bride of Christ, the Church, finds her full and final identity in her union with Christ. And that's why union with Christ is the foundation of all salva salvation history. It is not as though... It's not as though, as, the, as though in salvation, God gives us some package called salvation. The Father gives it to the Son, and then the Son gives it to the Spirit, and then the Spirit gives us that, that salvation package. That's not what salvation is. Our salvation is Jesus Christ Himself, whom the Father has freely given. In salvation, we receive all of who God is in the Gospel. That's the good news. I think that we tend to start thinking of salvation as a package gift. Something outside of God. If we think about our salvation along those lines, as though salvation was a package that He gives outside of Himself, we'll settle for less than what has been given. We'll settle for less than salvation. We'll start to exchange the gifts for the giver. And this is the beauty and the glory of the Gospel. From the fullness of the Son of God, from His fullness we receive grace upon grace. No Son given, no spirit given, no grace. In this gospel, there is nothing, give, nothing given to us from God that is apart or detached from His Son. Paul said to the Corinthian church, I desire to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So in Paul's passionate preaching, he wanted to them, them to know Christ. And that, Christ, and that Christ would fill all the other truth. All truth is formed by this one message given to us in the Gospel. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If you will, turn to Romans 1. So... I kind of want to do a span through the book of Romans. I want to see with you our union with Christ in the book of Romans in the first eight chapters. I want to move from chapter to chapter to show the direction of Paul's logic and his understanding of our salvation. And I want to see what is underneath it all. Paul in the epistle to the Romans is laying down argument after argument after argument. He has a flow and he has an end and it's continuous. And it's as though he's going, he's diving deeper and deeper until it culminates in chapter 8. And so let's see his flow of thought. In chapter 1 we see Paul, who is a bondservant of Jesus Christ, he is starting out with what he has been called to by God, to be an apostle for the gospel of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
to bring about the obedience of faith among all nations for Jesus Christ's name. And he says, among those nations, you too also are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to belong to Jesus Christ. And then we see his intent and his desire that he desires to see the people, the, those who are in Rome. And he de de desires to impart a spiritual gift that there might be a mutual upbuilding in faith. They share the same faith in Christ. And we see his urgency and his eagerness to preach the gospel to them, so much so that he just starts preaching the gospel in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. But then immediately, right after that, we come to a problem. In verse 18, we read, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Paul goes on to show that all men have a heart problem. There is a problem fundamentally that goes right down to our nature, the very fabric of our being. And in our nature, we are opposed to God. Even though God plainly reveals Himself to all people everywhere, even to the point that Paul says that they are without excuse, all humanity suppresses the truth and exchanges the glory of God for other things. All sons and daughters of Adam. So if you came from Adam, just like Adam, all people who are born of Adam do exactly what he does, exchanges God for creation. And Paul uses homosexuality as an example. And then he goes into a catalog of sins, sin after sin after sin. And some of those are being unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. And then he goes on to say, so God's wrath rightly abides on all who practices these things. And then Paul goes to Romans 2. And he knows that there will be religious people in that room in the reading of this, the Jew, and that they would be nodding and saying amen to all that Paul has said. They would be agreeing with the judgment of God rightly falling on all those who practice such things. They would give him a heartily amen. And then Paul points his finger at them and he says, you too. You also are without excuse. You the judge. God's righteous judgment falls on you also. You too are a son of Adam and practice the very same things. So how do they practice the very th same things? You exchange the glory of God for other things as well. Your things just look more religious, like circumcision. You trust in the law, and your heart is also darkened. And then we hear in Romans 3, how all are under sin, both the Jew and the Greek, all, everyone, according to God's law. All are unrighteous, no one is good, no, not one. And he concludes all of this terrifying news about God's righteous judgment on all people. And he says this in verse 19 of chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law comes the knowledge of sin. 
That's according to the law. All are condemned. But then Paul shifts his, shifts his tone in verse 21, and he says, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. He had just painted humanity as a pitch black group of unrighteousness before God, pending God's judgment. And then here we see, we see now the light appearing of the good news of the gospel. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Wait, so how can God still be just in doing this? I was just declared, according to God's law, that I was unrighteous. So the law proves me to be a sinner. How can I be declared righteous? It's because of this in verse 5. Verse 25. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, the righteousness that comes to me apart from the law is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God put forth Jesus Christ on the cross in order to absorb the fullness of the wrath of God against my sins. That means that Jesus Christ united Himself to me and my sins on the cross. My actual sins were actually united to Christ and atoned for on the cross. And Jesus Christ's righteousness is declared as my righteousness. When He was on the cross, He was united to me and received judgment for my sins there. This means that this all is a free gift. There's no work that I must do in order to be declared righteous before God. All of that work was done in Jesus Christ so that God may be just and the justifier. And Paul goes on that all boasting is excluded. By works of the law? No. The law of faith. In chapter 4, Paul uses Abraham as, as an example of justification by faith and how this salvation is rooted in the nature of who God is as being the God who justifies the ungodly and the God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence which do not exist. Paul is rooting our salvation in who God is. The promise of God came to Abraham before he was circumcised, not after. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So the promise did not come to him based on works. And the promise didn't come to him before. It didn't come to him after he had faith. The promise came to him before, before he had faith. And that promise produced faith in him that at all, the promise would rest on grace. The nature of who God is. And then therefore be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to Jews, but also the Greeks, including you. All who share in the same faith of Abraham, the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we come to Romans chapter 5. And it starts off with this. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Notice the union language there. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Pope Paul goes on to say how this hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And after this, Paul, the Apostle Paul takes a step back and then he starts to show us one, what is beneath all of this. He takes a step back to see the whole picture of our salvation in Christ. He goes all the way back to Adam. And is, I think it's here that he starts to point out the depth of what is going on in our union with Christ, in our salvation. What is underneath it all? We see here that the act of Christ and redemption is compared with the act that Adam committed. And we see the effects of the act that Christ did on all those who are in Him, compared against the, all the effects of the act of the transgression that Adam committed on all of those who are in Him. In verses 6 through 11, we see the act of Christ. In verses 12 through 14, we see the act of Adam. From verse, four, from verse 15 to the rest of the chapter, we see the effects of those two acts and all the, on all those who are united to them. So in one real sense, Paul only has two humans in mind in all of history. And you are either in one of those two. There's only two heads of humanity. Christ or Adam. And you are either in one of those two. And if you're in one or the other, all of the, the effects of their acts are imputed to you. Look at verse 12, chapter 5. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. That all sinned there is talking about the sin of Adam, the first transgression. So how did I sin when Adam committed that act? Did I sin? I wasn't even born yet. If you think about it like this, if I have an acorn, imagine I had an acorn in my hand. What is in that acorn? An oak tree, but not just an oak tree, there's more. What else is in there? Seeds, more seeds. In this one acorn, I not only have a tree, but I have a tree that produces more acorns. And all of those acorns will produce more trees that will have more acorns. In this one acorn, I have all the generations that come after it. I affect this acorn, I affect all the generations after it. That is why Paul says that in Adam, we too also sinned. We're un that's how united to Adam we are. And therefore, all of the effects of Adam's sins Sin is imputed to us in Him. And this is what I mean whenever I say Paul step, steps back and he, and he shows us exactly our whole salvation here as either being united to Adam 
or united to Christ, our salvation. And this is why it's so important that we, we believe in the, the uh, virgin birth. What happened in the virgin birth? Why, why, did it, why did Mary need to be a virgin when she conceived Jesus Christ? The reason is because the promise of the seed was promised to the woman, not to Adam. Right? The promised seed came through the woman, not Adam. Why? The reason is because if Jesus Christ came from Adam's seed, then he would share in the nature of Adam. He would be in Adam when he sinned. But that's not what is revealed to us in the gospel. In the gospel, we have a virgin birth. It wasn't man's seed. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Why was that important? Enter in a new humanity, a new head, Jesus Christ. If Christ came from Adam's seed, then he would share in Adam's nature. But Jesus Christ didn't come from Adam. In Christ's incarnation, he became fully human, being born of a woman, and so much so that he was fully human that he shared, as it says in Romans 8, that he shared in our sinful flesh, a, a flesh that can die and a flesh that could be hungry. And therefore, he became a head of a new humanity. So all who partake in his spiritual birth, because he was born of the Spirit, share in his new humanity, and therefore are recipients of all of his righteous life. We're talking about the, 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 what is underneath our whole salvation is our union with Christ and His life. And we share in His new humanity. Being united to Adam means sin, death, and condemnation for all in Him. Being united to Christ, even more so as Paul says, means righteousness, life, and justification for all in Him. And the language here is so strong that the Scriptures indicate that Christ took me to judgment already. In other words, I I'm so united to Jesus Christ that when He went to the cross and received judgment, He was carrying me through judgment. I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it is no longer I who live, but Christ liveth through me. Look at verses 18 and 19. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. In the gospel we see that this salvation is our being united to Christ. It is sharing in His life as a free gift of God's grace. This is eternal life, our union with Jesus Christ. Look at verse, verses 20 and 21, we read this, Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right after this comes chapters 6 and 7, 
And these two chapters are like the balance between two pendulums. And on each side you have sin and you have the law. And Paul shows us what our new relationship is to sin in our union with Christ and our new relationship to the law in our union with Christ. So Paul is anchoring us in Christ as these two chapters come to us. Coming right, af right after chapter 5, laying down the foundation of our union with Christ and how free the gift of salvation truly is, that it is all of grace, Paul sus suspects an uh, objection. If, if this salvation is truly that free, then people are going to use that grace in order to continue on in sin. And notice Paul's response is not this. No, we have the law of God still. He doesn't refer to God's law at this moment. He says, Paul, Paul is saying, absolutely not. You have misunderstood grace in the whole previous chapter if you think that way. The whole previous chapter was about our union with Christ. And he's saying, if you've been united to Christ, then you are dead to sin and alive to Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in in, on in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certain we shall, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin may be done away with, that there shall no, no longer be, we shall no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. Likewise. And it is here that we see the first imperative in the book of Romans. Not till six chapters later, we see the first imperative that God, that the Apostle Paul gives to us. It says this, Therefore, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He addresses our sin problem with our union with Christ. In chapter 7, we see another problem. And Paul answers again by reminding us of our union with Christ. And here the problem is legalism. Paul writes, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who has who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So our being in Christ and finding our identity in Him deals with the heart of these two problems. And this is uh, the way that this happens. The way that this happens is we must never think about any part of our salvation apart, apart from Jesus Christ. We, we must never think about anything in our lives apart from or separated from Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God will produce death and life in us, death to sin and righteousness unto life, by the Spirit, not by the letter, in Christ Jesus.
And then comes Romans 8. And here's where everything culminates. In this chapter, we see view after view after view about this whole salvation, everything that Paul has just been laying forth beforehand. In verse 3, we see our union with Him again, justification by faith in Christ, where God did what the law could not do by the sending of His own Son and the likeness of of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned our sin in his flesh. Union. Our sin in his flesh. In order that the righteous requirement, requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us. His righteousness in us. Union. Togetherness. So it's our sin in him, his righteousness in us. Us in Him, He in us. In verse 10 and 11, we see our union in the sanctification by the Spirit of God. Verse 10, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, Christ in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. In verses 14 through 17, we see our union with Christ and the adoption as sons by the Spirit, sharing the very life and status of the Son of God before the Father. Verse 14, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For if you didn't, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fall into fear, but you received the spirit of do of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of what? Heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him that we may be also glorified together. Union. Just a note on the Spirit. In John 14, Jesus Christ promised that His disciples, He was about to leave His disciples, and He promised to them that He'll never leave them. He's going to give them the promised Spirit. What did He say that the Spirit was going to do? Lead them into all truth. And not just that, but the Spirit of God declares to us all that is His. And that declaration is not just teaching, but that declaration is working the very life of Christ into His disciples. All that He... All that, he, all that He has, all that He is. And that means the very status and relationship that Jesus Christ has to, the, has to the Father is declared to us to the degree that we may with and by the Spirit cry, Abba, Father. So we share the very status of the Son of God before the Father. That's why Jesus Christ says, As the Father has loved me, he loves you, just as the Father loves the Son. He loves us. Never to be removed from the love of God. In verses 18 through 25, we see the hope laid up for us in Christ in the midst of suffering, groaning, and eager longing. In verses 26 through 27, we see the Spirit's intercession on our behalf. In verses 28 through 30, we see the inevitability of how we are going to obtain this whole salvation in Christ. It will happen. In verses 31 through 39, we see that we will never be separated from Christ and all of God's love for us in Him starting in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall, not, how shall he not with him graciously, freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Go to verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor anything created shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The union that the believer shares with Christ is indestructible. Look at what is surrounding this whole chapter. Union with Christ. The first verse. Therefore there is no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The last verse. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And as we understand this doctrine, the union that we have with Christ, it changes everything in our understanding of our relationship with God and our relationship with one another and our relationship to other things. And as our understanding of our relationship with God in Christ changes by the Spirit, our lives will be changed. I believe that as we grow in this love, abiding in Christ, union, we will become more conformed his, into His image. That's what the Scriptures declare to us. And we'll see more of Him flowing out from us. That's why Jesus Christ said, um, If any of you thirst, come to Me and drink, and out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. We will put more and more and more in our minds and our understanding into this context of our faith in Christ, our relationship with Jesus Christ, so that our lives will be experienced in Him. And as we grow in our understanding of our union with Christ and all that He did, that is all of grace, there will be less struggling in this Christian life, feeling, trying to feel His presence. We will be more and more and more grieved by sin, by our sin. The Spirit will produce death in us. And we will be more and more and more tired of legalism. I wanted to close with just uh, two verses from 1 John 4, if you will turn there. Verse 9 says this, In this the love of God was manifest toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Verse 16, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and He who abides in love abides in God, and God in Him. Father, we thank You for these glorious truths.